Hey class, let's continue our discussion of the skeletal system. This presentation is going to focus primarily on the joints and the physiology of the skeletal system. So, without further ado, let's talk about joints. You can categorize joints into three broad categories. We have our fibrous, our cartilaginous, and our synovial joints. All of these joints are where bone meets bone. And there can typically going, there's typically going to be some kind of a special interface between this bone-bone connection. First, let's talk about fibrous joints. These fibrous joints are typically going to be our immovable or very slightly movable joints, sutures of which between the cranial bones, like between the two parietal bones, or between the frontal and parietal, or between the temporal and the parietal, or between, let's say, the temporal and the occipital, between the cranial bones that make up the cranial cavity, those sutures are going to be very slightly movable when we're really young and then fuse together as we get older. We also have cartilag cartilaginous joints. Mm. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. These cartilaginous joints are typically the joints that are going to be very um, slightly immobile. And when I say slightly immobile, I mean you could typically have like five, maybe ten degrees of motion. So there's a little bit of motion, but not that much. Um, these joints, particularly the cartilaginous joints, are going to always be associated with fibrocartilage. So if we look at in between the vertebrae, we can typically have like five or degrees ish of movement per joint if it's really flexible. And we'll have those intervertebral discs, those fibrocartilage shock absorbers in between. Another example of a cartilaginous joint would be in between the two pubic bones that make up the pelvic girdle. There's going to be the pubic symphysis, that fibrocartilage patch there. We also have synovial joints. These are the joints that most people think about when they think about a joint. These are freely movable joints, like our ball and socket, our hinge joints, and they're going to have just a generalized structure that we'll talk about in just a moment. So here's our typical, typical synovial joints. We are going to have articular cartilage on the ends of bones, and then that joint is going to be wrapped in a joint cavity. There'll be some bursa, and oftentimes, if there is going to be, uh, particularly in the knee, there'll be a meniscus or pad tucked in there. For uh, all of the articular joints, there's going to be a little bit of synovial fluid that's going to be secreted around this joint in the joint capsule. And the synovial fluid is quite literally elbow grease. So if somebody asks you to go to the store to get some elbow grease, you can say, I'm sorry, but they don't sell synovial fluid at the store. But um, anyways, let's talk about how we can move the joints in our body. There are general motions, whereas we talk about these motions, I'm going to present them to you in terms of opposites. Um, so flexion and extension, you can think of flexing your, your elbow to make your biceps book, or you can think of extending your elbow to make your triceps look larger. So when we decrease the joint and angle, we flex it. When we increase the joint and angle, we extend it. We also have adduction and abduction. If you think of adduction, if you move your arms or legs towards the mid sagittal plane or midline of your body, you are adding it, ADD, adding the, the appendage to your body, it is adduction. And if you A, B is in boy adduction, move the part away from the midline of your body, you are going to be lifting your arm or leg up into the air. <coughs> we also have rotation. Rotation is typically going to be pivoting in body part around its axis, so you can rotate your forearm to flip your hand back and forth. You can also rotate your neck to say no, or with your head motions. We also have supination and pronation. With supination, you have the hand, the palm of the hand facing anterior or facing down towards the ground. With pronation, you can take the palm of your hand and face it posterior or downward, excuse me, not the palm of your hand. With pronation, you can take the back of your hand and face it posterior or downward. We also have circumduction. Circumduction is spinning an appendage to outline the shape of a cone. Inversion and eversion are going to be rotating your feet. Somebody who's an inverted runner is going to run with lots of extra weight on the ball of their foot or on the ball of their big toes. Somebody who's an everted runner is going to run with lots of weight at the lateral margins of the bottom of their feet. Now, let's talk pictures. These are gonna be a lot easier to understand than the word descriptions I was just going over. We have flexion where we increase, decrease the joint angle and extension where we can increase that joint angle. Abduction is moving up away from the body. And then adduction is moving down towards the midline of the body. We could have rotation where we pivot the body part on its axis, 
where we can have circumduction where we spin the appendage to make a cone. Inversion is putting the weight on the outside of your foot, lateral margin of your foot, and eversion is putting the weight on the medial margin of your foot. So, class, as we look at these joints, and we think of the range of motion associated with this joint. If we increase the range of motion, what will happen to the stability of the joint? So think of the sutures, the cartilaginous joints, and the other joints that we talked about are synovial joints. Will those, if we increase the range of motion, will the stability of the joint decrease, remain the same, increase, or depend on the special situation? So this is a thinker concept question. Um, I need you to synthesize information from this presentation with prior life experiences and then get me an answer. Go ahead and pause the video right now. One, two, three, four, five. All right, the answer is decrease. As you increase the range of motion, you decrease the stability of the joint. And let's go back to our joints to talk about this. The synovial joints, the ones that are very freely movable, these are the ones that we typically have the most damage occur to. These synovial joints are the ones, think of the knees, the shoulders, the elbows, the hips, these are the ones that we have major problems with. Cartilaginous joints you can occasionally have problems with, but not that often. And then the sutures, the fibrous joints, we almost never have problems with. How many times have you heard somebody complain of arthritic pain between their two parietal bones at their mid set or at their sagittal suture? It ain't never going to happen. But we hear people complaining about pain and joint instability for synovial joints all the time. So the correct answer was decrease. Moving on, let's talk about bone homeostasis. There are some cells associated with bone growth and bone maintenance and bone destruction and cartilage growth because we need to talk about cartilage growth with bone growth. There are two peas in the same pod. So first let's talk about our cell types. Anything that has blast as a suffix is going to be a building cell or a forming cell. Anything with class, C-L-A-S-T as a suffix, is going to be a destroying cell. And anything with site as a suffix is going to be a cell that maintains a tissue. Osteo is a prefix meaning bone. Chondro is a prefix meaning cartilage. So an osteoblast builds bone. A chondroblast builds cartilage. Osteocytes will maintain bones. And uh, osteoblast, as it's building bone around itself, will encapsulate itself in a bony tomb and turn into an osteocyte. Osteoclasts are a bone cell that destroys or breaks down bone tissue. How does bone develop? Well, the process of developing a bone is known as ossification. And ossification sometimes is referred to as mineralization in other textbooks. This process is when we just add calcium and hydroxy or calcium hydroxyapatite, so our calcium and phosphate ions, to the extracellular matrix of the bone tissues to solidify that bone tissue. And there's two ways we can go through ossification or mineralization. If we look at ossa, this prefix ossi, this prefix literally means bone. Think of osteo. This is the same root prefix for bone. So when we say ossification, we're, we can think of this term as bonification. If we were to literally look at the prefixes. So we have intramembranous ossification. So making a bone in between membranes or within, I should say, inside of a membrane. And then we have ossification, making a bone inside cartilage. Endo meaning in, chondro meaning cartilage. So we can have, make a flat bone between sheets of fibrous tissue, or we can make most of the bones of our body, our irregular bones, our long bones, our short bones, etc., etc., through endochondral ossification. Endochondral ossification is by far the most common method. Um, endochondral ossification starts with a hyaline cartilage mold or frame for the bones of our bodies. And this hyaline cartilage framework for our skeleton is formed in utero. And I'm talking about first trimester in utero. This is very early on during the pregnancy. And after that, let's skip ahead to the figure here. So first, very early on during the first trimester pregnancy, this hyaline cartilage model forms. And then we are going to have the long bone form a rough shape out of hyaline cartilage and we'll have a primary ossification center form as we have a collar of osseous tissue or a ring of compact bone tissue form around, around what will soon be the diaphysis. Next, this newly formed diaphysis is going to have spongy bone tissue develop in the center of its primary ossification region 
and then we have blood vessel penetration in the di excuse me in the epiphyses. These locations of blood vessel penetration in the, in the epiphyses form the secondary ossification centers. So we form our long bones from the middle and from the ends at the same time. And the cartilage will remain in between the diaphysis and the epiphyses. This ring of hyaline cartilage between the epiphyses and the diaphyses is known as the epiphyseal growth plate, or more generally speaking, a growth plate. And as long as we are growing taller, we are going to have hyaline cartilage right there. And once we stop growing taller, all of that hyaline cartilage at the epiphyseal plate or growth plate will be filled in with compact bone or osseous bone tissue. So let's look at that epiphyseal growth plate. We can have more hyaline cartilage growing from the epiphyse down towards the diaphysis. And as that happens, we will have the osteocyte, osteoblast within the epiphyses push growing down towards the diaphysis and converting more and more bone into diaphyses and into epiphyses. What we typically will see is a band of cartilaginous tissue growing and then osteocytes following the cartilage the cartilage so we have a front of cartilage growing and a front of bone tissue forming at in the cartilage how do growth hormones affect our bones generally speaking we need vitamin d to absorb calcium within our intestinal tract this is one of the reasons why you'll typically see calcium rich products fortified with vitamin D, everything from cow's milk to bioactive calcium supplements. Human growth hormone, HGH, sometimes it's referred to as GH, growth hormone, is also going to stimulate overall general bone growth and development, particularly at the epiphyseal plates. Um, so that it will stimulate that particular kind of bone growth. Um, individuals that are lacking or deficient in growth hormone, generally speaking, will have a form of dwarfism. Also, sex hormones, both testosterone and estrogen, are also going to have significant impacts on bone growth during the adolescent periods as well. We're also going to have a bone remodeling process. Then this bone remodeling process occurs every year, constantly. We're constantly dissolving our bones a little bit and then adding to our bones a little bit. Um, generally speaking, we can recycle between 15 and 18% of our bones every single year. This remodeling of our bones allows our bones to respond to stress. So as we change lifestyles, maybe we go from a sedentary to a very physically active lifestyle, we're gonna start stressing our bones out more. And in response to stressing our bones out, they are going to go physically, or, or become physically stronger. Two hormones that help to regulate our blood calcium levels by adding or subtracting um, bones from the body are parathyroid hormone, PTH, and calcitonin. Calcit PTH is going to increase the activity of the osteoclast, those cells that break down our bones. So as the PTH is incre increases in the bloodstream, we'll have more osteoclasts dissolving more of our bones, and then more calcium will go into our bloodstream. So we re when we have a low blood calcium concentration, we will release that PTH into our bloodstream. When we have a high blood calcium concentration, we are going to release a hormone called calcitonin into the bloodstream. Calcitonin has the exact opposite effect of PTH. PTH increases osteoclast activity. Calcitonin decreases osteoclast activity. So calcitonin slows down how quickly we dissolve our bones so that our osteoblasts have a chance to catch up and lower our blood calcium concentrations. But calcitonin specifically acts on osteoclasts. <coughs> During this bone remodeling process, we are also going to increase the diameter of our bones so that as our bone increases diameter, the width of the overall width of the compact bone tissue remains about the same. So we'll have bone formation on the outside and bone absorption on the inside. What does this result in? This results in an adult bone that has an la overall larger medullary cavity compared to a juvenile or infant bone, which has an overall smaller hollow space within its diaphysis, that medullary cavity. Sometimes, though, bone destruction outpaces bone development. 
And in those situations, generally speaking, it's going to be someone who has chronically low blood calcium levels. And if that individual has chronically low blood calcium levels, they'll constantly have or chronically have elevated PTH, parathyroid hormone, and then will be constant or chronically dissolving their bones faster than they're building their bones back up. Generally speaking, this bone reabsorption will begin to outpace de bone development around the age of 40 for most individuals. Um, risk factors include being female, white Asian, being thin, having a family history, early menopause, smoking, diet low in calcium, excessive caffeine or alcohol consumption, and a sedentary lifestyle. These are all things that you, you, these are all things that, generally speaking, can be reversible. Obviously, gender, ethnicity, skin color, family history, those things are much, very, very difficult, and especially early menopause. Most people have no control over that. But we have some uh, things that are typically going to be associated with lifestyle, like smoking, dietary choices, um, beverage choices, um, and physical activity levels. Those things are much easier to control for individuals. So if you are someone who's worried about having osteoporosis later on in life, you can immediately get up, start moving your body, start stressing your bones out so that they can increase their density. You can in increase your calcium and vitamin D consumption, cut back on the caffeine and alcohol, and if you're smoking, stop smoking. And that will definitely help you to increase your bone density so you don't have very porous, weak bones later on in life that are much more prone to being fractured. So one of the big complications associated with osteoporosis is a broken hip. Most people that break their hip die within one year of breaking their hip. Not necessarily from the hip breaking itself, but because of all the complications associated with breaking a hip and then having the hip replaced. Hip replacement is a very big deal. To treat osteoporosis, there are some drugs and hormonal regimens that can be done. Lifestyle changes are huge and dietary changes are huge. Hormone treatment has Fallen by the wayside, though, about five years ago, it was found that estrogen supplementation to treat osteoporosis for postmenopausal women significantly increases the risk of developing breast cancer. And most women, if they have to choose between developing breast cancer or having osteoporosis, would rather take the risk of osteoporosis than increase the risk of breast cancer because many more people die from breast cancer compared to osteoporosis. But in selective situations, a physician will still occasionally prescribe hormone therapy to treat osteoporosis. It's just not as common anymore. Let's say you break a bone. What steps do you go through as you are repairing your bone? The first step, let's see, let's go to the figure here. This will be much easier to talk about. The very first step is you have the hematoma, the blood clot. This blood clot forms almost instantly within six to eight hours. And this blood clot or hematoma will be held in place by the periosteum and it bulges outward. After we've clotted the blood, the blood turns into cartilage, particularly fibrocartilage. And that fibrocartilage is then replaced with spongy bone to form a bony callus. And then we're going to have more ossification and um, deossification. And we'll end up with a healed fracture. And at that point that has the healed fracture where we've gone through the bone remodeling, the compact bone on the outside of the diaphysis is thicker than it was before the break occurred. So, class, concept checked. I want you to think critically about healing a bone fracture. After repairing a fracture, a bone would be weaker, remain the same, stronger, or it depends on the situation. How would the strength of the bone be changed at that repair point? So go ahead and pause the video and give me an answer right now. Five, four, three, two, the correct answer is stronger. After repairing a fracture, at the repair point, that compact bone tissue is much thicker, so the bone strength at the point of repair is going to be stronger. This is the reason why very few people break a bone at the same spot twice. This is also a reason why it's very important to have your bones properly set so that they heal in the correct orientation. If the bone is not properly set, you could have it heal and an incorrect alignment and in order to fix that the physician will have to go in and break the healed the healed fracture and that's typically pretty difficult to do because it's so much stronger now where it has been where it healed so make sure that if you have a broken bone you get it set properly so that it heals properly you'll save yourself a lot of pain and that's all we have on our skeletal system. If you have any questions for me about this material, please feel free to post them on the class discussion board, shoot me an email, or swing by my office if you're on campus. Happy studies!